All right, welcome to our lesson on kinematics. So kinematics is um, it's difficult in a sense because it takes stuff that you feel like you would know intuitively and then tweaks it a little bit um, just to pull some calculus into it, bring a lot more specificity to the situation. Um, so what I'm hoping is that you continue using this intuition that you've built throughout your life about how things move and speeds and all those types of things, but then just fine tune it with these calculus concepts. And there are like huge applications here in physics. So if you've taken that or had any chance to study physics, um, then hopefully that kind of supports your understanding of kinematics and calculus here. Okay, so I'm working on page 266, example 28. And I have already included the equation they give you, uh, but let's go ahead and read the problem and see what they're asking us to do. So it tells us that a particle is moving in a horizontal line uh, so that it's positioned from a fixed point after t seconds, where t is positive, greater than or equal to zero, um, is given by this, uh, this equation here. So in kinematics and physics, you're going to find that position functions are represented by an s. So S is the position in, rep, um, in relation to time T. So S of T, it's a function. And then velocity is going to be the derivative of that position function, right? Because derivatives or rates of change tell you how quickly your position is changing. And if your position is changing, that's just a velocity or that's like your speed, but really velocity because speed is not direction sensitive and velocity is. Um, Okay, so the first part says find the position, velocity, and acceleration of the particle after one second. So as you can see, I've organized my space as position, velocity, and acceleration so that I can kind of keep a clear understanding of what I'm finding um, and not get confused here. So if I find the derivative of position, that would be like S prime, well, that tells me how quickly my position changes, and that's literally just velocity. Velocity tells you how quickly your position changes. So that first derivative is your velocity function. Notice that it's just, you know, it's not v prime or anything, it's just v, right, v of t. So my velocity function is given by the first derivative of this, which winds up being something like 10t minus 4t cubed. All right, well, if I want to know my velocity after one second, let's just use that velocity function and plug in one for time, one second for time, and that should tell me what my velocity is after one second. So let's do V of one, and I find that this would be 10 minus four times one cubed, and essentially it's just the number six. Okay, so my velocity after one second is equal to six. And again, these are our calculus ideas getting pulled in to what we already understand about position, time, all that stuff. Okay, now the connection between velocity and acceleration, um, I almost like to think about in terms of like driving a car. So, you know, the gas pedal can also be called an accelerator, right? Press down on the accelerator. Um, so it's basically how quickly your velocity changes. Um, if I have positive acceleration, that means I'm speeding up. So I might start in my car going at like a constant speed. There's no acceleration going on. But then I see the car in front of me is going kind of slow. So I move lanes and I hit the gas to go faster and get around them. Um, now I've got acceleration. So now I'm moving more quickly. It also works if I hit the brakes. The brake is technically an accelerator too but it's negative acceleration. So maybe a decelerator or something like that. Um, but acceleration is just the rate of change in your velocity. You might be speeding up, that's positive acceleration, or slowing down and that's negative acceleration. So that's where your positive and negative values come into play here. So I wanna know how quickly is my velocity changing? That's acceleration, so I need to take a derivative of my velocity function, and that tells me what my acceleration is. So again, notice it's V prime here, but then just a straight up A of T, right? Acceleration after time. And I wanna know what is, um, what is that function? So my acceleration function has to be the derivative of my velocity. So it looks like 10 minus 
12t squared. Okay, what is my acceleration after one second? Plug in one and see what we get. So I get 10 minus 12 times one squared, and essentially I got negative two. So what that tells me, just like I was explaining earlier, when you have negative acceleration, that means you're slowing down. So my velocity is still positive. I'm still moving forward. It's like coming up to a stoplight. Yeah, you're still moving forward, but your foot's on the brake. So you're slowing down, even though you're still moving in the forward direction. So that's how your velocity can be positive, but your acceleration is negative. Okay, by the way, maybe a couple of units here. We're moving in meters per second, and then this winds up being meters per second squared. Um, and we can look into the units of that more closely if you're interested. Okay, so part B says, determine whether the particle is speeding up or slowing down at t equals one. So is the car speeding up or is it slowing down? Is that an acceler or a, a velocity question or is that an acceleration question? Well, if something's speeding up, that's like, is your velocity changing, right? Is your speed changing? Are you speeding up or slowing down? So if you're talking about your velocity changing, that's acceleration. That's a change in velocity. And we've already talked about this. If you have a negative acceleration, that means you are slowing down. So kind of like you're driving up to a stoplight or a stop sign, you're still moving forward, but your foot's on the brake and you're now slowing down. Okay, so that's part B. Part C, find the values of T when the particle is at rest. So kind of the hardest part of this is understanding which one of these am I really talking about? So when is the particle at rest? Think about what that means in your mind. That'd be like your car is parked, right? It's not moving anywhere, it's at rest. So what do you expect is equal to zero maybe here? I mean, yeah, your acceleration is equal to zero, but really we're talking about velocity here. When is my velocity equal to zero? When is my car no longer in motion, forwards or backwards? I just wanna know when is it stopped? When is this particle stopped? Or when is the object stopped? So when does it have zero velocity? All right, well, let's decide when that happens. So I'm looking at my velocity function and I wanna set that equal to zero. I have no motion at all, so zero velocity. Um, would look something like this, and then you can just solve that, um, maybe factoring. So I could take out 2t, and I'd be left with 5 minus 2t squared, which is kind of interesting. So if I set each one of these equal to 0, then I'm getting something like 2t is equal to 0, or 5 minus 2t squared is equal to 0. Here I just set find that like t is zero. Here, if I subtract five and divide by two, or negative two, right, then I get something like t squared is equal to negative five over negative two. And when I take a square root, I find two different numbers, positive or negative, five halves. Okay, the interesting thing about this is that negative, time being negative. So this is where mathematics and reality get a little bit off sides, right? Because in reality, we're not really representing negative time. That'd be like going backwards in time. But we only started counting the velocity or the position when t was positive or zero. Um, if you go back to the original part of the problem, it said that t was greater than or equal to zero. So anytime you get negative answers for time, those are what we call extraneous solutions. It's a mathematical uh, situation, but not represented in real life. So I'm not gonna talk about that negative. In fact, I'm just gonna leave it as a positive answer, square root of five halves. So that's when the vehicle's at rest. Also, when time was equal to zero, the vehicle was at rest. So both of these are interesting um, solutions. So apparently the car started with zero velocity at rest, and then it traveled and came to rest again. So that's what that would represent. Okay, um, part D. 
find the time intervals on which the particle is speeding up and the intervals in which it's slowing down. Is this an acceleration or velocity question? So hopefully you're thinking from our previous conversation, that's acceleration. That's an acceleration question because I'm talking about my speed changing, right? Am I speeding up or am I slowing down? So that's really an acceleration question. How is your velocity changing? Is it increasing or is it decreasing? So that's an acceleration here. All right, um, as you probably guessed, we're going to do like a sign chart because I wanna find if my acceleration is positive, that means my velocity is increasing. I'm speeding up. If my acceleration is negative, that means velocity is decreasing, so I'm slowing down. So let's find a sign chart here. I'm gonna just start this idea. So if I'm putting a sign chart together, well, first I need to know when is my acceleration equal to zero and then test in between to see positive or negative. All right, let's start with this equal to zero. So when is my acceleration equal to zero? 10 minus 12 t squared. So if I subtract the 10 and divide by 12, I'm getting something like 10 twelfths equal to t squared. And then if I take the square root of both sides, um, again, I'm getting kind of that negative answer as well, but I'm going to toss that answer because I'm not interested in negative time. Remember the constraint. So t is equal to square root of 5 over 6. You might want to punch that into your calculator to even get an idea of what that number is. Um, but for now, I do know that 0 is less than it. So what's my acceleration when time is equal to zero? Let's take that and plug it in up here. Uh, it would be positive because I'm getting something like 10 minus 12 times zero, and that would just be zero. So 10 minus zero is um, positive. So essentially concave up, right? Second derivatives, tell me concavity. Um, and this is really speeding up. speeding up there. And that interval, if I want to be careful, uh, is really a matter of going from zero, because time is either zero or positive. So I'm speeding up anywhere from zero to square root of five over six. And then over here, let's say if I grab something I know is bigger, like I know that three is going to be bigger than this number here. So let's take three and plug that in. Well, three squared would be nine. 12 times nine is pretty big. 10 minus that, definitely negative. All right, so here I am slowing down. Here I'm slowing down. And that means anything from square root of five over six. Um, well, I guess just anything above five over six is when it's gonna be slowing down. So I don't really need anything on this side of that. All right, so I've created some space for myself on this last question because it requires a bit more work and pulling some things together and thinking to get this correct. So the last question, part E says, find the total distance the particle travels in the first three seconds. Okay, the word distance there is key. It's different than displacement. So remember that displacement means you could have maybe a positive or a negative position. If I'm talking about like the origin being right here, then if I move forwards from the origin, that's positive displacement. But if I move backwards from the origin, that's negative displacement. And distance does not work that way. So distance actually says, hey, I don't care where your origin is anywhere that you move from the origin, I'm going to count as like distance traveled, right? Like you still went that distance, so we give you credit for going that distance. Um, displacement is not that way, however. So the question says distance. We need to be really mindful about whether or not our little particle dude is moving forwards or backwards because this is a displacement equation. It's a displacement function. It does not add things up in a distance kind of way. 
it'll calculate your displacement from the origin. So it's important to have that distinction. Um, for example, this function might look something like this. So it would be counting this as being positive distance away. And then this would be negative distance away. So if I try to add the positive and negative, some of those, um, some of those meters basically are getting canceled out. Okay, all of this to say that I need to think in terms of when is this thing moving forwards and when is it moving backwards? Find those distances and add them together. Okay, I know from previous work that the particle was at rest at a couple of times, sorry, zero was also another time. So from square root five over two to zero, or zero to five over two, this thing was at rest. So was it moving forwards in between or was it moving backwards in between? Let's take a look at that. So if I want to see my velocity, I know that the particle was at rest at zero seconds and it was at rest at square root of five over two seconds. By the way, if you plug this into a calculator, it's about 1.58 seconds. So three seconds is somewhere over here. All right, was my particle moving forward or backwards at either of these intervals? So I might grab a number from in between here and plug it in to see if my velocity is positive, positive forwards, negative backwards. So let's take one. If I plug one in here, I get 10 minus four. Um, which is six. And we actually already knew that from previous work. So that means it's positive. I'm moving forwards. Okay. So that means all that distance is counted as positive two. Uh, over here, if I say the number two and plug that in for my velocity, well, two cubed is eight. Four times two is 32. 10 times two is 20. So 20 minus 32, that's negative. My particle is moving backwards here, so I need to be really mindful about how I calculate those distances. All right, in order to do this successfully, I need to essentially take this amount of motion and add it to this amount of motion, counting both of those as positive. So let's kind of see what happens here. So to find the motion that we are moving forwards, I'm just going to find the displacement uh, at time square root five over two. So because I'm moving forwards, I know that that's already gonna be a positive amount, so I don't really need to do any tricky workarounds. All right, what was the displacement after uh, square root five over two seconds? So plugging that in, I get square root five over two squared minus um, square root five over two to the fourth power. Um, so the square kind of undoes that root and I get what, like 25 over two minus, uh, this, you know, the fourth power is just kind of like a squared being squared. So I can kind of apply it as being like squared, uh, and then squared. So that first, um, power of two gets rid of the square root and the second power of two uh, squares the number inside. So that becomes 25 over four. And then combine our fractions with like terms, we get 50 over two minus 20, how about, how about 50 over four, minus 25 over four. And this is just what, 25 um, fourths. And if I wanna maybe make that into a decimal real quick so I kind of have an idea what's happening, four goes in here um, six times with one left over. So 6.25 meters in the forwards direction. All right, how far did we go in the backwards direction? So I basically need to find the distance or the change in motion um, that I went from three seconds to that, that resting spot right there in the middle of the root five over two. So to do that, I need to find the position after three seconds and subtract the position after square root five over two seconds. Okay, so um, for the position at three seconds, I just plug that in again. So five, three squared minus three to the fourth power. I already know what this value is. So how about subtract 6.25 from right here. 
Um, okay, squared gives me nine. Nine times five is 45. And then three to the fourth power is 81. Uh, and then minus 6.25. I'm going to grab my calculator and finish that off. So 45 minus 81 minus 6.25 equals negative 42.25. OK, so I'm hoping that this negative value does not bother anybody. I knew that it was negative because I was going backwards. So this idea, again, back to distance, I still want to count this as positive when I add it to that value. So I went forwards this amount, but then I went backwards this amount. So in total, I went 42.25 plus 6.25 meters. And like, that's my total distance here. So if I want to put all this together and get my final distance answer, it's going to be something like 6.25 plus 42.25. And this should give me what? So 0 0.5, I guess 48.5 meters. So it's a very different question to be asking about the distance an object moves versus a displacement at a certain time. Displacement, just plug it in and like that's, that's your answer, you're done. But if you need to know distance, then you kind of have to account for all these things, um, you know, being at rest or being in motion forwards or backwards. So just be really careful about the words that you're using and the words that the question is using so you answer it correctly.